It's good to make a, a disclaimer right at the beginning of my message. I realize that I have been, been working on these messages for a while. I don't, I don't just come off at the last minute and think of what I'm going to preach next week. But I realized it was right after the elections. So I don't want anyone to imagine that I'm preaching this because I'm saying that the end time has come and that Donald Trump is the Antichrist. <laughs> you know? That could be, I was working on this before Donald Trump became president or Hillary would become president, but I'm sure there's people here who's like, oh, you see, you see, it's true, I saw it on Facebook, I heard it, he's the Antichrist, no doubt about it, but no. I'm going to talk about it because of the importance of being anxious, of panicking. There's so many things that can cause panic for us. All of us know what panic is like. Panic is when you're sitting there and you look over at the clock and it says four o'clock and you say, oh, I had a doctor's appointment at three. And you start to scramble around, you run, you get yourself ready, and then you realize, oh, oh, no, that's right, it's next week. <laughs> but you already, you already have that panic mode. Or if you're a pastor, you have panic dreams, you know, just in case you ever want to get into the world of the pastor. Panic dream is like this. Panic dream is that you dream that it's Sunday, that the alarm clock did not go off, and you wake up and it's 1045. And you have 15 minutes to rush, shave, get ready. And I, I, had, I was having this dream where I was panicking, running, getting ready. And as I'm doing all this, I'm getting dressed. Finally, I'm thinking I'm going to make it at 11 o'clock. 15 minutes, I've done it. Wow, record. The alarm clock goes off. And it's 7.30 in the morning. But I still have that sense of panic inside of me. Now, I'm, now I'm, in the morning, I already have that panic, that sense of panicness. You know, when I was a young kid... Especially talking about the end times, I had that panic as well. I don't know about young people today, if, they get, if they're indoctrinated that way. But when I was young, you know, there was always the fear that Jesus would come back at any moment. The rapture could occur. And so we were scared. You know, you show up in the meeting, you're 15 years old, you show up in the meeting, no one's there. I'm like, oh, I was left behind. <laughs> I was not taken. Of course, I learned early on that if you are with Cubans... You better have a 30-minute rule to your end times. You better say, well, I showed up, wait 30 minutes. Okay, now the end has come. Because <laughs> people would always come in late. You know, and I was always an early person. You know, I, didn't fit, I didn't fit that stereotype of being late. But Paul is writing to Thessalonians because they have panicked. They have panicked. Something has happened and has convinced them that the day of the Lord already arrived. And somehow they have missed the boat. Despite the fact that Paul had taught them, despite the fact that he had instructed them on these things, they still were be able, someone was able to somehow throw them off course and make them believe there was trouble. And so Paul begins to address this. And the first thing he does deal with is his idea and saying about concerning the second coming of Christ. And he tells us that it's not yet happened. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and are being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or a word of mouth or letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Somehow, they have gotten this false idea, this false interpretation, this misrepresentation of the teachings of Paul, that the day of the Lord has come, despite the fact that Paul has instructed them. But Paul, of course, doesn't know how they got this. He doesn't know if it's through a word of prophecy. He doesn't know if it was someone said, was teaching on the teachings of Paul and said something that was beyond Paul or was a letter. But whatever it was, it completely threw them off. And they were unsettled and believed that the end had come. And so Paul has to go back and remind them about what he has said. And the first thing he does mention is the things that he has said to him concerning the day of the Lord and being gathered with him. And in 1 Thessalonians, Paul had talked about this. He had talked about that great and glorious day when Jesus Christ will return and the saints will be gathered to him. And he said, we don't need to mourn like other people mourn. You know, they had lost loved ones and they feared that somehow maybe their loved ones would not be able to partake in that great day because they had died. He said, no, we don't cry like they cry. You know, people in this world weep differently. If you're not a Christian... And you come to that day when you're standing there by a coffin. You weep differently than somebody who has hope, who has faith. And they were coming to that situation, and they're saying, my goodness, it's hopeless. He says, no, not for you. 
You know, when people of the world come to that coffin, they are hopeless. And they try, of course, to do what I call, you know, they didn't do it back then, but they do it now. Today, they, they do what I call putting on the Christian suit. You know, when someone dies, all of a sudden, everybody becomes Christian. We're all believers. We're all godly people. We all go to church on Sunday. We all worship the Lord. We all pray. We all read the Bible. You know, because they want to believe at that moment, at least for that moment, to hold on to some sort of hope. But... For us as Christians, we don't live like that. We're not pseudo-Christians. We're not non-Christians. We have faith and hope in the Lord. And so when we come to that moment, we can trust that everything will be fine. And that things will happen because God's in control. And that, although we do weep, we weep because we miss that person. We're not hopeless. And then he goes on to tell them in verses 15 through 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the voice, trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. In 1 Thessalonians, it reminds them of the great blessed hope that we have. You know what the great blessed hope for Christians is? The second coming of our Lord. It's not the rapture. You know, so many times people put the emphasis on the rapture and they think, oh my goodness, the good thing is that before anything bad happens, we'll be taken out of here. Well, I have some bad news for you. Uh, we will not be taken out of here. We are the witness who will be here. We will be here when the great tribulation occurs. And we will be the ones witnessing for the Lord. You may know, so many times I used to watch these films left behind, you know, all the Christians taken. And then who's going to witness for Jesus? Oh, somebody found a Billy Graham tape where he was met. Oh, that's what it means. You know, my goodness. No, we will be here. And when Christ returns, then we will be caught up to meet him. And that word caught up, translating to Latin, is rapere, where we get our word rapture. The rapture is not some secret meeting where Christ comes back incognito shh, and takes us. We will be here. We are the witness of the Lord. We have nothing to fear. We're not like this whiny generation, right? We're not, like, we're not afraid. We will go through it. You know, the first five centuries of the church, they had no problem believing this. They understood that we would die for the Lord. That we are to be witnesses. The word martyrus, which is witness, means also martyr. We are to die for the Lord. They were not afraid of this. We will go through tribulation and we will witness, but we have the great hope, the blessed hope that Christ will return. And when he does, that we will meet him. But something happened to these Thessalonians. Somehow they were shaken. And somehow they believed that somehow the day of the Lord had occurred, even though Paul tells them, no, we're going to meet him in the air. They thought, oh my goodness, maybe some sort of spiritual rapture has occurred. And there are so many things that throw us off. You know, as the people of God, it's so important to know the word of God, to be grounded in things of God, and not to allow people to shake your faith. You know, don't let their anxieties be your anxieties. Don't let their fears be your fears. And unfortunately, sometimes preachers contribute to that. And we all become pretty paranoid running around. I remember when Harold Camp Camping was predicting the end of the world. And of course, you know, I was talking to someone this morning. He had a great ministry, a wonderful ministry. God was doing great things through him. But unfortunately, he got lost in thinking that the end had come, that he knew something that every other believer did not know, that even our Lord Jesus did not know. And he started proclaiming this. But people started going crazy. They sold their properties and gave their money to his ministry. Some took their retirement fund and took, you know, they took all the retirement fund and they went off on great cruises thinking, oh, well, the end's going to come. Who cares? Let me go have fun. You know, I remember a man uh, during that time who had cancer and doctors told him, go have an operation. He's like, why? Jesus is coming back. What do I need an operation for? We thank the Lord that his wife was more powerful than Harold Camping. <laughs> because she certainly put him in shape and he had that operation. He's still alive today. We cannot be troubled by these things. And yet we always trouble, you know, someone goes.
around like, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. You know, I've been reading lately that if Hillary became president, Armageddon would start. And then I read on this side, my other friends who wrote that if Trump became president, Armageddon will start. Like somehow Armageddon depends upon them. Like somehow God's timetable won't happen unless this thing happens. You know, think about it my way, the way I think about things. What about if this big election thing, of course it's been big for us, it's huge, awesome, amazing. What about if this thing that we think is so huge is but a speck in the plan of God? What about if God, from God's perspective, Maybe that day when we're about the elections, we're so worried. Let's say that on that day, a child is being converted in Korea who will become a great evangelist. And that's the center of the plan of God, what he's doing at that moment. Not the elections here. But we get so fixated, thinking somehow, and we panic. And we go out of our way thinking, my goodness, the sky is falling. And again, it shows that we get all lost in these things. Let me tell you this much. If you get lost in all these things, there is a solution. There's a great solution. Besides listening to sound teaching, there's a, there's a great solution. Shut off the TV. Seriously, shut it off. Shut off the radio. If those preachers are putting fear into you, shut them off too. Because we should be encouraging each other with the coming of the Lord. This is a glorious thing, not a bad thing. This is not a... You know, Jesus is coming. Everybody's panicking. What? Panic? Maybe non-believers should panic. Yes. If you're a non-believer, panic. If you don't know the Lord, panic. Panic is good for you. Because it might lead to your salvation. But not for us. And Paul says, we will meet him. And he says, look, when I was with you, I gave you instructions, further instructions about these things. He told them other things about the end times. And there's two things he told them. And I want to deal with those as well because they're so relevant to us as Christians. Scripture makes it clear that certain things must happen before Jesus comes back. People say, well, can Jesus come back tomorrow? No, because certain things have to precede that. Certain things have to happen before Jesus returns. And he mentions only two things here. First of all, he says in verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will, come, will not come until the rebellion occurs. You know, to deceive means to cause someone to have a wrong view of things. These people are being deceived. They're being led astray. Now, of course, they must have received some sort of word, maybe a prophetic word, maybe someone trying to teach, saying, oh, no, what Paul meant was this instead of that. And it superseded the teachings of Paul. You know, I never feel bad as a preacher, as a teacher, when people misunderstand me. I never feel bad when, when people might take something I say and go completely in a different direction because, hey, they did it to Paul. If you can do it to Paul, hey, who am I? <laughs> You're bound to misunderstand me. But they misunderstood Paul. And somehow they took this teaching and they got warped up. And people do get lost in these things. You know, someone comes around and tells you something that something's going to happen. And everybody's like, wow. Just, just this week alone, I was talking to someone who was telling me about someone who had a vision. And in this vision, this girl dies and stands before the great throne of God and she's being judged and she's being told about all the opportunities she had to be saved and things like that and why she didn't repent. And then she's going to be thrown into hell. And I told the person, oh, you mean it's talking about the great white throne judgment. That's what she had a vision of. She said, oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't that. It was a particular judgment just for this girl. I said, but the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that they will all be judged at the end of the great white throne judgment. And I started talking this. And then I realized, in about five minutes in, in, within our conversation, I realized I'm having to defend the Bible in light of this vision. Rather than this vision being defended in light of the Word of God. The vision superseded it. And sometimes people take whatever it is they take from wherever, and it supersedes the Word of God. Nothing supersedes the Word of God. It has to coincide with the Word of God. Everything that is from the Lord coincides with the Word of God. And these people had gotten off because they had, gone against, they had taken something that was, again, above the Word. We have to see that certain things have to happen. One of them, of course, is the rebellion, the great rebellion, the great apostasy. And this word can refer not only to leaving the faith, 
but it also talks about some sort of a military or political rebellion. And the idea is that there is coming a time when a great rebellion will occur against all forms of authority. Forget the marches that you're watching on TV and thinking, <gasps> anarchy. There's a time coming when it will be multiplied a hundred times over. Where people will become rebellious against every form of authority. Paul tells in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he says, For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. There's coming a time when people will not put up with the Word of God. They will not put up with sound teaching. It will bore them. It will annoy them. They will not be able to tolerate it. And today we already see elements of that. We see people who don't like to hear the Word of God, who don't want to be instructed in the Word of God. They want to be told great stories, fantastical things, but they don't want to be in the Word. I remember years ago when I was in Bible college, uh, a, a man was coming to lecture. His name is Edwin Yamauchi, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. Brilliant. Third, he knows at least 13 languages. The guy was incredible. He's coming to lecture <clears throat> on the book of Daniel and the prophecies there. And I was so excited. And I wanted to listen to this guy. I was the youngest. There were about only 10 people. I was the youngest. Everybody else there had a PhD. I was like, my goodness, everybody should be here. This guy is brilliant. This guy knows the word of God inside out. This guy's a great teacher. But hardly anyone shows up. On the other case, I've been to places where someone, some popular speaker is going to talk about Revelation, talk about Daniel, and it is jam-packed. And he has great graphics, and he has awesome lights, and wonderful music. And I'm listening to him talk, and I realize they didn't mention Edwin Yamauchi. When I hear someone talking about something and I realize that the best scholars, the best teachers are not being mentioned, that tells me a lot. People don't want to hear something that's solid and grounded. They want the sensational. They want the great stories. You know, don't tell me about what the Word of God says. Tell me, you know, even they might even say, give me your feelings or tell me what you think rather than tell me what the Word of God says. You know, Charles Spurgeon once said, there will come a time when it won't be shepherds feeding the sheep, it'll be clowns entertaining the goats. And that time certainly has arrived where people go after entertainment rather than the Word of God. Let me say this much. The Word of God is the Word of God. And whether you have a preacher, now some people are blessed, they might say, well, my pastor is, look at my pastor, he makes some jokes, he's very animated. Some pastors are not. Some pastors may be very dull, but they are preaching the Word of God. They're not there to entertain you. They're not there to make you feel good or happy. They're there to teach you the word of God so you can grow to a full maturity of Jesus Christ. That's why God put them there. That's why it's important to listen to them and to grow in the word. And Paul says, don't be fooled. This coming of Christ is not going to occur until you have the rebellion. Until you see all these authorities being overthrown. And when the authorities are being overthrown, that's the perfect time for the lawless one to rise up. Look at verses 3 and 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God, or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This, of course, is the Antichrist. But notice the first thing that it says about him, which I love. Because it says the, law, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Automatically, the first thing that Paul says is like, look, don't even be concerned about him. He's doomed. From the word get-go, he's doomed. He's no threat to you. His fate is sealed. You cannot oppose God and think you're going to win. So even before he rises up, even before he does what he does, the word is already proclaimed. He's conquered. He's finished. That's to encourage us not to be concerned about that as well. Yes, there will rise an individual 
who, who will be called the Antichrist. And of course, he's not going to come and say, hey, I'm the Antichrist. You know, I'm the man of lawlessness. He's not going to say that. On the contrary, the Bible makes it very clear that he's going to bring peace. He's going to bring harmony. He's going to bring unity. He's going to take all these lawless things and put them together. And when he's brought it all together, he will claim himself to be God. And he will demand worship. And whoever does not worship him will be killed. Of course, when people hear that, of course, the first thing they want to know is, who's the Antichrist? <clears throat> That's the sensational part. You know, if you're ever curious, study about the Antichrist. In Bible college, I wrote a paper on the Antichrist, and I was shocked. I was like, wow, like almost every generation has an Antichrist. They think it's this person, you know. In my generation, it was Gorbachev, you know, Ronald Wilson Reagan, 666. They had, everybody has a... I was, that's why I was looking forward to Hillary. Hillary would have been interesting. Because no woman has ever been claimed to be the Antichrist. <laughs> that would have been like, wow, that's a new thing, you know. It's always been a man. It would have been interesting. The first one that people believed was the Antichrist was Nero. Because he was such a vicious animal. A hater of the faith who brutally, brutally killed our brothers and sisters. In ways that should not even be named. And they thought, this one has to be it. And for years, they waited for him to come back, thinking he would return. And he never did. Of course, another candidate for Antichrist has always been the Pope. Poor Pope. Pope gets picked on. And people always think, oh, that has to be the Antichrist. Now, there's a reason for that. The reason, it's not like, oh, just some makeshift thing. There's a reason for that. Because the Bible makes it very clear that this individual will have power. Governmental power, religious power. So the reason people keep looking at the emperor, keep looking at the king, keep looking at the president, keep looking at the pope, is because this person is going to have supreme power over all people. He's going to rule all of them, every authority. It's not like he's just going to be a religious leader or just going to be a governmental leader. He's going to be both. But notice that as Christians, we have been forewarned about this. It should not shock us. When these things begin to occur, don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. You know that the time is near. You know that Christ is coming back sooner. But there's something that stops it from happening, even now. And Paul tells us about the restrainer. Look at verse 6 and 7. And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. Now, the bad thing about this part is that Paul says, you know, when I was with you, we talked about it, and I told you about the restrainer, <clears throat> and I'm like, no, Paul, I was not there. <clears throat> the Thessalonians were there. I was not there. So please inform us. But Paul doesn't. He just mentions that there is this power that is holding back evil. Have you, have you ever said, you said to yourself, wow, it could have been worse? Yes, exactly. Anytime you see evil in the world, you hear the words, it could have been worse. Yes, it could have been worse. God not merely works for good, God also restrains evil. If evil really could have its way, it would destroy everything. By its very nature, evil destroys, evil wants to conquer, evil wants to kill. The only reason ISIS cannot do what ISIS wants to do is because there are forces holding back ISIS. If it wasn't for the nations holding them back, they would be relentless. They want to kill. They want to destroy. But they can't because they're being held back. Well, the Bible makes it very clear that God holds back evil. And I believe, of course, that what it's talking about here is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one restraining evil. But one day, God's going to say, no problem. And He's going to allow the world to have what the world wants. You want lawlessness? You want to rebel against God? You want to pursue evil? No problem. There will come a time when God will not restrain, when God will allow. And if you really want to see how bad it is, book the, read the book of Revelation. We've been going through the book of Revelation just going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not good. And yet all the time we're told that there's a seal upon the people of God. That all the evil things that will fall upon this earth, we will be protected from it. 
because God is with us. The Bible even says that God will shorten those days for the sake of the elect. So God will always be watching over us. But those who follow evil will pay for the evil that they follow. Verses 10 through 12. <clears throat> they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. God comes to us and the truth of the gospel is there and it's witnessing to each and every one of us to believe but the choice becomes ours whether we will believe the gospel. You know, it's ironic because some people say, well, they can't believe the Bible and the first thing I always ask them is, have you read it? I think that's just a logical question. Maybe in my circles, that's a very dumb question. I don't know. Does that make sense? That's like me telling you I hate Black Sabbath. And you say, well, have you ever heard a song by Black Sabbath? They go, nope. Just hate them. You would think it's stupid. If the Bible is the Word of God, and we're telling you it's the truth of the Word of God, why not read it? What is there to be afraid of? You know? I've read the Quran. I've read the Buddha scriptures. I've read the Hindu scriptures. I've even read the Satanic Bible. What is there to fear? If God is God, what is there to fear? This is the word of God, the truth of God, and yet they will reject it. And because they do that, again, God hands them over. Is this really what you want? You want the lie? You want the delusion? Then you will have it. And you will have the full effect of that. You know, to, to spit in the face of God, to reject the mercy and grace of God, there has to be consequences for that. But for the people of God, there should be no fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. You know, and I've noticed it's not only been Christians, it's been people in the world. Even the world's so scared because of the market, ISIS. They, you know, they even came out with a movie in 2012, right? Because of the whole Mayan calendar. You know, I even had to do a study on that because of that. <laughs> you know, people get scared now. Everybody's so afraid. The world is like in chaos and turmoil. But not the people of God. You should not be moved. <clears throat> None of this should take you by surprise. If Hillary's elected, Hillary's elected. If Trump's elected, Trump's elected. It doesn't matter ultimately because God is on his throne. We are believers. Don't, don't be shaken up by these things. On the contrary, when you see them happening, realize that the day of the Lord is near. And that's a glorious thing. That's a good thing. That's something that we should rejoice about, not something we should be afraid of. You know, it's ironic that Paul in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 4, when he tells believers about the end times, the last words he says is, comfort one another with these words. Comfort, not bring fear to one another with these words, not put paranoia on people. Comfort, comfort. This is good news. This is the blessed hope of the arrival of Christ. Again, if you're set in fear, that's my advice. Shut off that TV. The reason you have that fear and that paranoia is because you're listening to that tube and you're listening to that radio. Pick up the Word of God. Pick up the Word of God. You know, Martin Luther was trimming the bushes when someone asked him, if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you be doing? He said, trimming the bushes. <laughs> when you trust in the Lord, when you know the Lord, you have nothing to fear. You're ready. As the people of God, we've been told to be ready and to watch. We're ready. So no matter what we're doing, we're ready for his arrival. So we should not be troubled at all. On the contrary, the only thing for us is Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. That's our hope. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the great hope that we have, knowing that you will return to this world. Father, we pray that your people will be at peace, that nothing will be able to steal that peace from our hearts, and that, Lord, the voices 
that are causing anxiety, that are making us panic, Father, that we'll be able to shut those voices out and hear the voice of your Spirit speaking to us and guiding us deeper into your presence, deeper into holiness. Father, that we will be ready, knowing that we are in your vineyard, we are working, and we are prepared for your coming. Everything will be well. We thank you that in your blessed kindness to us, you have revealed these things to us to prepare us for, for that time. Strengthen us with your Holy Spirit that we'll be faithful to you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.